If you're an entrepreneur, you've taken big risks, created many jobs, and devoted yourself to your business. When it comes to building your succession and transition plan, who should be involved? What are the steps along the way? Welcome to Finish Big, the podcast with Mark Dorman, sponsored by Succession Plus, inspired by the book, Finish Big, How Great Entrepreneurs Exit Their Companies on Top, by the noted entrepreneurial author, Bo Burlingham. In this podcast, we share success stories along with our expertise and knowledge about what will probably be the largest financial transaction of your life. Now, on to the show. Good day. This is Mark Dorman, your host of the Finish Big Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Melanie French of French Sales Solutions. Let me tell you about Melanie. Melanie is a fractional VP of sales who works with mid-sized companies looking to develop and improve sales function of the business. This includes sales strategy, its process, the use of CRMs, as well as salesperson hiring and management. After spending the first part of her career in a private equity-owned company working her way up to VP of sales, a company that was about $230 million in revenue, by the way, she was responsible for 75 sales and service employees. Melanie now serves the small and mid-sized business community as a fractional vice president of sales. We're going to really dive into that. Working with companies looking to develop or improve the sales function of the business, and this includes sales strategy, sales process, et cetera. Melanie French, welcome to Finish Big, the podcast. Thanks for having me, Mark. Super excited to be here. Well, I'm delighted to have you. Let me just pause for a minute and give some background to our listeners. Why would you have a vice president of a fractional sales VP on a show about exit and succession planning? It really all goes back to our goal for the show is to give and provide business owners who are looking to maximize the value of their business prior to exiting. And what we found in our industry and in our practice, both locally and nationally, is that oftentimes sales management is a big challenge and the lack of a professional sales management team. So professionalizing a sales management team leads to more sales, we hope. More sales could lead to more profits, but more importantly, having a professional team leads to a greater value in a company. That's the overall goal. So Melanie, let's dig into your background. Your bio says that you worked for a fairly large middle market company. Without getting into too many specifics, how long were you there? Where did you start your career? Where did you go to school, et cetera? Yeah, I was at the company for about 11 years. I actually started right out of school as an individual sales contributor and worked my way up through various leadership positions and ended up at the end as the VP of sales for the organization. So we weren't always 230 million. When I started there in my career, we were probably about a $50 million company. So we oh, wow. experienced pretty significant growth over the period of time that I was there in that 11 years. That really was a catalyst for a lot of what I do today in terms of things that we tried, growth strategies evolving from a smaller business into a much larger one and really scaling things. Interesting. Interesting. Now, if I call, you went to the University of Finley, correct? I did. Okay. In Finley, Ohio. And you are yes. a self-proclaimed horse person, I believe. Yes, I am. How long were you with this company? And in what role did you start as a salesperson yourself? And then all of a sudden, because sometimes the best salespeople don't necessarily make the best sales managers, correct? 100%. I would say I probably spent maybe three-ish years in an individual contributor role. The company had a sales development program for recent college grads that I came on board into. I was good at sales, but I, was, I wouldn't have ever called myself the rock star individual contributor. I was very much interested in helping build and develop the business from a larger scale and be in a leadership role. And so my career path vision was always more of that leadership and sales management type path. That always was what drove me from a career perspective. And I spent a little bit of time an individual contributor. Ultimately, I shifted into a leadership role, actually running our inbound call center in that particular company. And so part of what kind of the liaison between sales and the sales leadership and the call center piece was really our initial stopping point or starting ground for the sales development program actually had incoming people starting in our call center. 
And so I spent a lot of time on hiring, recruiting, and developing people within that department that ultimately ended up in our sales development program longer term. Interesting. So what, what kind of industry was this? Can I ask? Yeah, we were in the wholesale apparel industry. So we sold blank t-shirts, hoodies, anything you could put a logo on basically into the screen print embroidery retail market in terms of people that would then resell that product. So would you do things like corporate swag, like embroidered sweaters and ball caps? So we didn't do any of the decoration. We sold to the companies that actually did that work. So we were the supplier of the blank t-shirt that they would then purchase from us and logo. And And this was a privately private family business when you joined them? They were owned by a small local equity firm when I originally started with the company. And then partway through that journey, we were bought by a larger equity company at Austin. Okay. So when you arrived, it was about 50 million in sales. And when Mm -hmm. you departed about five times larger, roughly, um, walk us through kind of that journey. I mean, we were in the call centers. At what point did they say, Hey, we'd like you to develop our sales team, lead our sales team. I'm just curious because I've been around a long time. Was there a, a lot of sales coaching that went on or was it more, Hey, just team go out and sell more or go get them tiger. Or was there a Sandler <laughs> program in place? Were there accountability procedures, anything along those lines? A little of all of the above. I would say it was a pretty rogue environment when I first started starting to have some structure. And part of what I would interested me, it was really systematizing and creating structure and process around all of the things that we were doing sales-wise so that it wasn't, hey, team, go sell more. There was a lot of that early on, not from me, but just from the way that the organization had lived up to that point. That really evolved over time. One of the things that the company invested heavily in prior to me getting there was Sandler Selling System or Sandler Training, Mm -hmm. if you're familiar with that. We spent the whole time I was there, pretty much we were a Sandler company. I would say we utilized pieces of it. We did regular training. As I got more involved in the sales leadership, we got much more consistent about how we were going about things and utilizing that structure. That was a big piece of the evolution of the company was utilizing the elements of Sandler that fit within our business and systematizing all of that internally so that we had our own processes around how do we do this thing called sales. Yeah. How do we track, right? I don't want to, yep. I want to get into that. I mean, because I know I've got a good friend of mine in my community that is a terrific Sandler coach. I've been through some Sandler training over the years, but that's not sales management, right? I mean, that's more sales nope. techniques and best practices. And as I said, you could have these terrific men and women that are just natural born salespeople. They could proverbial, you know, sell ice to Eskimos, but leading a team of 75 by the time you left and having a coordinated strategies and tactics on how they're tracking leads, how they're managing their sales funnel, what their process is, what type of CRM did you adopt? And did you adopt more than one and did it kind of evolve? Did you kind of mature from one to the other? Can you share with our audience a little bit about that? Yeah, we actually used a, we'll call it more of a homemade, homegrown, home-built system. We had a an ERP system that was very industry specific to us. They had a CRM, I will call it module that was pretty terrible, but we actually ended up building on top of that, our own customized solution to really manage our workflows and what our salespeople were doing from a call perspective. We were Mm -hmm. very heavy into phone outreach, building relationships with our customers. And so the CRM system that we utilized One, it was integrated with our ERP, which was a big key part of all of our metrics and being able to track. And But we developed a system that was custom to us that essentially queued up who they were supposed to call next based on a lot of different things. We had our own internal set of criteria. We were evaluating, tracking information we were collecting from conversations. And that all those things together helped us drive the activity in terms of who should be called. I think you and I would both agree on on that point. You'd have the best CRM in the world, but if your sales team doesn't have a high level of discipline to keep their records fresh and that data clean, it gets corrupt pretty quickly. And all of a sudden your analytics are essentially worthless, right? 100%. Yeah. I want to touch on that, but before we do, I want to just take a step back when you're looking and I want to move kind of forward, but then come back a little bit. So for just be fluid with me here for a moment. You started up, you know, French sales solutions. 
What was the genesis of that? Was that born out of COVID? Was that more of a work-life balance type move? Share with us how that was born. Well, a little bit of all of those things. Ultimately, what spurred it was the company, we were bought by another private equity firm that I mentioned. That really shifted the culture of the company fairly dramatically. I was there for several years after that happened, but I kind of got to a point where I felt like I needed to be doing something else. And then COVID kind of It just wasn't any fun anymore? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, And so COVID was in between that and in all of that too. And the promotional products industry was hit extremely hard by COVID. Mm -hmm. I'm talking like 90% sales drop, right? You think of all the events, activities that do swag yep. gone yep. In overnight. So the business took a pretty big hit. I ended up having to lay off a significant portion of my staff. I was not one of those people, but I was already kind of in a mindset of, I probably need to go somewhere else. Like I just, I needed to do something else in my career. Mm. I decided that right as COVID started. And so that obviously made finding a job kind of difficult because the world was literally on hold. And I just came across this fractional VP of sales concept and was really interested and intrigued one just of the I've always been kind of interested in a consulting type business or arrangement I had throughout that process with my old company we did when we were bought by the private equity had a really had a consulting company come in and do quite a bit of work and evaluation and provide some really good insights and so I was very intrigued to be able to do something similar kind of a watching them saying hey I think I could do that I think I might like doing that down the road right Yes. It came up and I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this. I'm going to jump and start my own business. And I was born out of that with French sales solution. So I quit my job by choice in June of 2020. And no pressure there, Melanie, right? (laughs) And launched this business. And here I am almost four years later. Wow. Good for you. Let's talk about French sales solution. Exactly define what we mean by fractional VP of sales or a fractional sales VP. Yeah, so fractional exists in other capacities as well and would fit this mold, fractional CFO, fractional COO. There's all these types of fractional C-suite roles. But the concept, generally speaking, is hiring a really high-level strategic person that if a big corporation were to hire them is probably a multi-six-figure type position. Mm -hmm. Small to mid-sized business is never going to bring in someone of that caliber on a full-time basis. They don't have the money for it. It does not make sense. There's just not enough for them to do in that world. But from a fractional standpoint, you're taking someone with that skill set and chopping them up and getting a piece of that expertise at a high level that's a bit more sized for your business. Mm -hmm. So it allows that small to mid-sized business to really have access to a level of talent that they never really would have otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. And talk to our partnership about what size a company or the specific industries that you're targeting, et cetera. Yeah. So size of company, I would say typically the, like from a fractional VP of sales standpoint, or what I look for in clients is usually they're five to 25 million in revenue and they don't have anyone in that strategic high level VP of sales type role. Like there's nobody really running strategy, managing the team. They might have somebody that they call a sales manager, Mm. but it might be a salesperson that got kind of thrown into that role, never had any training or expertise or experience other Mm. than selling for that company in that role. And so this is really about elevating the perspective, elevating the skill set of the team and bringing in real outside expertise and counsel around that part of the business. Interesting. And at any given time, how many clients will French sales solutions serve? Three to five, yeah. would you say? I'd say that's on the high side. Okay. Um, I Depending, my engagements vary, but I have an intense, what I call six months kind of implementation, execution engagement that's really doing the heavy lifting of what needs done. And that particular piece of my offering, I typically have two or less in that phase at any given time. Now I have others outside of that, but I'm a high touch, low volume provider, which is what I found to be most effective in getting results. Is that more of a deep dive current state? Here's where you're at now. What are you doing that's working? What's not working and helping with strategy, developing of maybe KPIs, accountability, that whole thing. And then there's, there's probably an implementation and a monitoring phase. Would that be right? Yeah. So that initial, like what's working, what's not working is my audit phase, which is about a month long. And then 
from there, we develop out an implementation, which is usually about six months. And so that's really building out the whatever is missing, whatever is kind of critically broken for that particular company. And, and then and, beyond that, keep the train on the tracks, ongoing support. Yeah, model. just kind of checking in, right? I'm sure that high, higher level of touches early on to kind of get that cadence and keep that accountability and that tempo up, so to speak, right? Yes. Yeah, so our, our guest today is Melanie French with French Sales Solution based in Cincinnati, the Queen City. What are you seeing are some of the big issues as you kind of look at your clients and prospective clients? What are some of the trends that you see I mean, I want to talk about best practices here in a minute, but what are some of the worst things that you see that need fixed in a lot of these small to mid-sized businesses? The biggest thing that I see is the, I'll call it accountability slash sales management slash we tie that into more metrics. So they just don't have a good system around what are my people supposed to be doing? Are they doing it? And how are we creating a culture of accountability and managing to that? And it's not about micromanaging or anything like that, but it's more about like, what do we need from the company and each of the individual contributors to be successful in our mission long-term this year, five years from now. And so that piece is very commonly either no metrics or not the right metrics to really move that needle. Hi, this is Mark Dorman. Sorry for the interruption. I know you're listening to the Finish Big Podcast, and I'm excited to have you here. If in the event you have any questions, please head over to www.succession.plus backslash US and where you can find out how to reach me. I'd love to hear from you. And now back to the show. Yeah. And then I would imagine you just see a lot of blank looks on your face when you ask people like, how are you tracking this? Or what's your process for this? Or how many sales calls is your team meeting? I mean, I know entrepreneurs very well. I'm one of them myself. And sometimes we're our own worst enemy. We say, let's just go sell more, 20% more than last year. But there's really not oftentimes a lot of meat on the bone as to what are the granular day-to-day tactics that I need to make that happen underneath the strategic umbrella, right? Yep. It's just, here we go, go get them, go get them, Tiger. So where you're taking your clients, I imagine, you strike me as a pretty structured individual. You're happy to be in sales management and have 75 salespeople reporting to you. What are some of the KPIs that you develop? I know there's going to be some industry specific ones, but kind of give me a general list of some of your foundational elements. And let's talk about your process as well. What does that look like? First off, let's define, you know, there's leading indicators and lagging indicators. And so from a KPI perspective, I want to look more at a lot of people will confuse the two and call a KPI or key performance indicator, let's just say closed business or sold or one business, which yes, that is a key performance indicator, but that's more of a lagging indicator. And so when I'm looking at what are we doing on a daily basis, we can't really control a lot of times, and this depends on sales cycle, but We cannot control whether the business closes, when it closes, what opportunities are going to come to fruition or not. All we can control is, are we doing various activities or executing various steps of the process? And so I'm most concerned with the leading indicators, which are all of those action items. Are we doing them? Are we doing them well? Are we doing the quantity that we need it, right? Quality, quantity, all that stuff. And it depends on the company and the industry and a lot of different things, but that could be anything from phone calls number of first meetings or first time appointments that we have with a particular prospect that could be number of emails we're sending. It could be social media type connections or conversations. Yeah. I mean, I know when I started kind of stuff. Yeah. In my career, I mean, there was formulas, right. And you knew that if you did the activity, the results would lead to these results, right. You just can't say, I'm going to get these results. And then your activity, your activity doesn't, doesn't match up, so to speak. So How are you assessing and do you have some specific industries that you favor with French sales solutions or is it more building the infrastructure, the habits, if you will, and taking it from there? It's more like building the infrastructure. And I would say I don't have an industry specificity, although I would categorize it more as I'm B2B focused. So I don't do any B2C type work typically. High ticket B2C where it's a much more consultative highly considered purchase. From a B2B standpoint, there's more transactional, there's high ticket, low ticket, long sales cycle, short cycle, all that. Mm -hmm. But I would say I tend to fit 
not necessarily by choice, but what I found is a lot of the folks that need the most help have been in the more, I would say, higher ticket consultative type space. And most of my clients tend to fit in that space for whatever reason. Why do you think it? I'm just to help me understand that. Why do you feel that most of that industry, the higher ticket, longer sales process needs more sales management assistance or needs more fractional assistance? Because the results don't come as quick and they don't necessarily know what's wrong or what's happening for the results not to be created. In a quicker sales cycle, you get feedback real quick. Ah, That's a great point. Did I sell? Did I not sell? Versus, I mean, I see companies all the time where they've got reps that have been on the books one, three, five years and really are not paying, not only are they not really positively impacting the company from a revenue profit standpoint, they're actually costing the company money and they mm-hmm. still work there, but they don't really, it's going to take a while, right? It's within their mind, like the business owner or the leader's mind. It's going to take a while for this person to ramp up or do well or start to produce anything. But the whole time, they're really not doing any of the stuff. Yeah. You have to track the activity. Actually, They've got to be sowing the seeds, them. right? But then a year down the line, it's like, oh, well, they should have sold something and then they didn't. And then it's like, well, crap, like, what am I going to do with this person now? Right. And they don't really know what the problem is. They just know that they're not selling stuff. Right. Um, right. That is the hardest part. They've got to get to a point where they know what actually has to happen and then track against that. And if it's not, then you can start to make corrections mid cycle versus waiting until they don't sell anything yep. to figure that out. Yeah. And that's a it's, long time in those longer sales cycle, higher tickets. Yeah, this has been good. This is interesting. Again, give us top three best practices that French sales solutions would look to adopt. I would imagine it's going to be accountability and tracking would be one. Ooh, yeah, that's a good question. Let's see. Only three. <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> best practices. Number one, I would say you definitely need to have metrics around both results and activities. That's absolute best practice you should have everything in a CRM and you should have all of your people utilizing that. And that should be part of your metrics. I mean, you want to pull the metrics from there, but your your metrics really should be part of your accountability. The last one I'm going to touch on is hiring. Mm -hmm. Best Mm -hmm. practice, you need a structured process, someone who knows how to hire salespeople. That's one of the, I'll tie that in. You need a process around how you're evaluating resumes, what you're even looking for, the questions you're asking in the interview process. You need an efficient interview process, but you also need one that's going to net you a positive result in the end in terms of a valid candidate. Yeah. You need a process to hire good talent, a process to hold them accountable, watch their behavior. I would imagine you get a lot of pushback from the old school folks when you say implement a CRM and log every one of your calls. And that's got to be a bit of an uphill battle, I would imagine. It can be. A lot of the clients that tend to do well with a fractional VP of sales or even just other leadership roles coming into play, usually the company has a vision and a culture around wanting to grow and Mm -hmm. investing in their growth. So I frequently see a lot of like EOS companies that are the entrepreneurial operating system or the book Traction for those of you not familiar, but those types of companies tend to have a lot of structure around what they're trying to build. And so typically the people that has been communicated and the high level, high level of buy-in, right? So usually the people are bought into that process and are interested in whatever it is that kind of comes along with that journey, right? There's going to be evolution and change. And the ones that aren't interested or aren't bought in, so they either get there eventually or they may choose to Exit the business. I mean, it's never about going in and firing people. Like yeah. there's never one anyone like that overt. I think some people question things a bit and or they test the waters, right? Hey, how serious are you? Are we really doing this? How much is the company or the leader, the main leader going to toe the line on yeah. when push comes to shove? Gotcha. So okay, one last question. And our guest today has been Melanie French Sales Solutions. Melanie, give us an example of a client you started working with. Where were they upon your arrival? Where was their sales team? What percentage, what was the change in the, the positive effect that you, and impact that you made on this organization? Oh, yeah. Well, I recently worked with an insurance company. They sell commercial insurance, but I was brought in because their team, they really didn't have any structure process around how they were selling or any metrics, no CRM. They would, I would say probably three of the five salespeople you would 
classify as significantly underperforming and not on a path to really ROIing mm-hmm. <laughs> from that standpoint. We went through a process to really implement all the things I just mentioned in terms of process and structure, but the big one was KPIs and really tracking what they were doing, but also pipeline, what kind of meetings they were having and getting things a bit more top of mind and just really having visibility to all of those things. So I had one of those three ended up on a great track now. She is killing it. She's not 100% where she's very new to the organization, but she's probably did 10 times the sales she did in her first year last year, Good for uh, you. which is amazing. And then I had another particular rep who ultimately decided that this organization was not for him and ended up deciding to move on. Mm-hmm. That was okay. It was a loss, but he had been there for quite some time and really hadn't produced the level needed and wasn't getting where he needed to go. The metric made that pretty clear as yeah. well as some, some comp yeah. changes. And then we had another one, and I get into this quite a bit, but the it's also a family business, and this was the one of the owner's sons who was in a sales role. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, it was after a lot of conversations, figured out that maybe he wasn't quite in the right seat. And so it ended up being a very net positive for the organization. He shifted into a different role and out of the sales role. And now we have a pretty well-performing sales team as a whole. That is on the track to not have all that the lower performers kind of dragging things down. Yeah. And so yeah. So you got a little more positive mojo in the room. This has been yep. great, Melanie. Our guest today has been Melanie French with French Sales Solutions. Melanie, tell our listening audience how they get a hold of you, please. Yeah. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. Search the name Melanie French, or you can email me at mfrench at frenchsalesolutions.com. Excellent. Or at FrenchSalesSolutions.com on, on the website. There you go. So if you have a company between five and 50 million in revenue, folks, ideal clients looking something like two to 15 salespeople in the B2B market, check out our friend Melanie French. She'll help you grow your company. You grow your company. You grow your value. You grow your value. You might have a better chance for a positive outcome when you exit. This has been Mark Dorman, your host of the Finish Big podcast. Until we meet again, folks, here's to finishing big. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed listening to Finish Big, the podcast with Mark Dorman, sponsored by Succession Plus. Don't forget to click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. Visit our website at www.succession.plus slash US or give us a call at 330-350-5410. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of of Succession Plus. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional tax or legal advice. Always seek the advice of your legal or tax professionals with any questions you may have regarding your specific situation.